Praise God. Well, let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can raise your hand and an usher, an usherette will bring you a, will lend you a Bible. Just raise your hand up. And let's turn to Hebrews. As we've been saying, and it shouldn't really frighten us, or, or I always like to say that Hebrews, we're in the deep part of the pool. We're in the 12 feet. And, uh, and, and we're working our way through this wonderful book. And um, we just pray that God would continue to bless us as we uh, honor him and study it. Let's pray one more time and ask God to bless our study. So, Father, again, we are opening the word, Lord. What an honor that is and a blessing and a privilege, Lord, to do it in this country, Lord, that we love so much. And so as we do that, may you open us up, God. May we just read your word and seek application and illustration, Lord, that we may leave here different than the way we came, with a nugget, with a thought, with all from you, with, with, with a application that we can live out this week, Lord God. Help us, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I remind you that the last time we were in the book of Hebrews, if you look at verse 4, there was a, a warning given. He said, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. That's in important word since they crucify again for themselves the son of God and put him to an open shame this is a a severe warning that we left last time off we left off last time in the book of Hebrews and if you would know as you're studying through the Bible yourself wherever you're at the Bible is full of warnings However, we need to know the truth in order to appreciate the warnings, amen? And by the way, if you want the commentary on those verses, you can go back to our last study, and we taught on that. But those verses that the writer lovingly warned the church of and the consequences for those who leave the faith and as we would say, backslide. Because it's definitely talking about a believer. In context, some of the flock, some of the congregation have backslid back into Judaism, which really doesn't make sense, but they went back. They went back to the rituals. They went back to the ceremonies. They went back to the offerings of lambs and bulls. And I I just can't imagine that, as we shared last time, how they were going through that And as the writer says, putting to shame Christ who completed all that on the cross, saying, in a sense, without words, what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough. But he lovingly warned them of the consequences for those who leave the faith. Warren Worsby says, truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. And he's doing it in a loving manner, But he has to warn them. He has to tell them. He came finally to the point of what he's been trying to tell them from verse 1 of chapter 1. But at this point now, as as I see it, he's now going to address those who have stayed, those who haven't left yet, (laughs) because they're still contemplating going back. And again, they're under a lot of pressure They're now Christians. They're no longer going to temple. They have family members. They have friends. They have the priests. They have all these people that are are at them and, and, you know, against them. They have been, no doubt, uh, eliminated from families and family gatherings and ostracized from friendship and fellowship of what they once had. But it's not about God turning his back on them. And it's not about God turning his back on us. 
but God leaving the 99 and going after that one. Sure, we can pray for those who have left. We can pray for those who are backslidden. We can pray for those who are in the world for whatever reason why they, they, they left faith or they left the gathering. But it's God who's going to go after them. It's the Holy Spirit that will convict them, and it's by that alone that's going to bring them back. Sure, we can drag them in there and sit down, brother, and... But if their heart's not here, then they're still not here. They're still backslidden. Friends, sometimes you have to accept who's leaving and appreciate who remains and look forward to what's coming next. We, 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 sure, we, we pray for them, we, but we have a flock still here that needs to, con- to continue to grow and mature and be taught God's word. We can get so fixated on those who left. At least as a pastor, I can. When I hear of a family leaving or I hear of a person that's left, I get so fixated on that and I start to pray for them and wondering why they left and, and praying that, they, they, that, that maybe they just left this congregation and they're going to another congregation. But then you hear, no, they're not going anywhere. They're, they're, for whatever reason, they're just not in fellowship. But we can get so fixated on those who left and forget to encourage those who stayed. We pray for those who are backslidden. We pray for those who are falling away. But we have to focus on those who are among us. And this is what the writer is doing now. He's given a strong warning. He doesn't want any more people leaving. He doesn't want anybody going back. After the strong warning, he says, look at verse 9, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we, though we speak in this manner. And he's referring back to those verses. He's referring back to last, last time we were in the book of Hebrews. He uses the word beloved, and it, it, it's the only time that it occurs here. And what an appropriate time to write this out under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What a, what a great way to transition from that harsh warning to say, but beloved, divinely loved ones. It speaks of God's love. It's a term of endearment. It's a term that the church used for addressing one another. And I address that to you because we are all the beloved. We're beloved of God and and we can call one another the beloved. He says, and he gives a note of certainty, of certainty. He says, we are sure, hey, we are confident of better things concerning you. The better things than those who are crucifying again for themselves the son of God and putting him to open shame. And bearing thorns and briars instead of good fruit. Better things. He says, concerning you. Things he sees that accompany salvation. The work of the Holy Spirit who is our comforter. The work of the Holy Spirit in their life. He says in verse 10, for God is not unjust. He he wants them to know this. This attribute of God. That he is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. Which you shown toward his name. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. These these are other um, things that he sees that accompany salvation. But he wants to make sure that they understand who God is. He's omniscient. God is not unjust. That's a great declaration of who God is, the perfect, just judge. And I hope that gives you great confidence because he is the perfect, just judge. Some of you may walk in here and you feel like you've been violated. You feel like you haven't gotten your time in court or you've been accused wrongly and and everyone else is, is believing the other party. And hey, let me tell you something. You serve the perfect just judge. And he says, 
For God is not unjust to forget other things that accompany salvation, your work and the labor of love which you have shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You see, the the writer can see great potential and even some budding of fruit in in these Hebrews. Yes, by this time, they should be disciples. They should be teachers. But he he wants to encourage them that God is our audience. And God notices even the little things, the, the small steps that they are taking that we take in serving him by serving others. I think again of that church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3 who Jesus had a, a lot of unpleasant things to say about them or about the other churches I should say. But now he comes to this church here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia mean, meaning brother loved or the beloved. How many of you are from Philadelphia? Anybody here? God bless you. Is that true now? But anyway, uh, the city of brotherly love, man. This is what Jesus said in verse 8 of of Revelation 3. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it. For you have little strength. But you have kept my word. And have not denied my name. How simple that is. Lord, I'm wiped out. God, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't see how I'm even here today this morning. How I even made it through and even got through these doors, God. It's been rough. But he says, oh, but I love that because you're still here. You kept my word and you haven't denied my name. The Hebrew saints have put God, those who've stayed, have have put God's name to open praise as they have ministered to the saints and do minister. Guys, we have been created, you know, when we become born again, there's just something in us, isn't there, that we, now we want to, we want to serve, we want to help. That's just our normal reaction after salvation. What can I do? Lord, how can I serve you? What can I do? You find a church. It's a local church. You look at the church. You see the needs. And you just want to help. You just want to serve. There's just something that's, that comes with salvation. And in that area, the, his, his recipients, in that area of serving and caring for one another, they get an A. Now, in their maturity, probably a C minus, Somebody would say D. But they must move on to mature in their faith as well. And he's told them that. But your, your service, your works are great, man. Let's, let's keep on. Let's move on. Because what happens if, you're, if you don't mature in your faith and you got some great works, well, then, then the works become your identity. And, and now you're... You're on balance. You're thinking, well, God will only love me if I serve, serve, serve. No, God loves you. God died for you, man. He did all the work. That's just a natural response. So we want to do both. We want to serve, but we want to mature as well, grow in our faith. And there's a desire for this writer here. He has a desire. Notice he says, and we, who is he speaking of? We Perhaps he's speaking of the, of the leadership. Yeah, perhaps he's speaking of the elders. Th- those who are mature and, and those who have been assisting or helping. He says, and we desire that, number one, notice in verse 11, each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. The diligence you have, that, that, that desire that you have to serve, will keep... Keep that desire, but also keep it to the full assurance of hope until the end. Don't lose that. Don't lose that desire, man, to stay the course, to finish the race, to complete, to complete the, 
as an athlete completes and breaks through the the winning tape. See, the writer is coaching them. And he's coaching them on to continue in their development. The overseer cares and prays and loves the flock of God that is before him. Some have left, okay, we'll pray, but I've got to invest in those who've stayed. His desire is for them to press on in their good works and passionately persevere in their faith and not turn aside from it. Because you know that can happen. It's my desire as well for every one of you to grow in your faith. For every one of you to experience that servanthood of serving one another, caring for one another, making a meal for one another, rocking a baby to sleep as the parents can sit and hear and be fed, and vice versa. We all do our part. That's, that's my desire, that's your elders' desire, and that's your ministry leader's desire. That you grow and serve, serve and grow. He says to take to the full assurance of hope until the end. Hope is so important to mankind. I don't know if you knew that. It's so important. Someone has said when, when a baby is born, it needs, to be, it needs to be cuddled. It needs to be held. That's why they wrap it like a, a burrito. You ever see babies? And you're like, man, I'd be like freaking out if I was like that. They, they, they need that, that assurance. They, they need that closeness. But more important, they need their mom. They need the skin to skin. It gives them, in a sense, hope, doesn't it? And as we raise them, they need that hope. They need love. They need encouragement. No movement has ever gripped the hearts of people if it did not give them hope. We have the greatest hope there is, guys. We're going to see that. Hope is so important that a famous British cardiologist, I I quote this here, he wrote, hope is the medicine I use more than any other. Hope can cure nearly anything. I wonder who's here today that can use some of that medicine. I wonder who walked in there and said, Pastor, I need hope. Give me some hope, man. Don't give me dope, give me hope. I need hope. Well, you couldn't come to a better sermon, not because I'm giving it, because of what's written in this scripture, what the Holy Spirit wrote for us, to get hope. Hope has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. That name is Jesus. Do you know him? Have you received him as your Savior and Lord? Well, that's the first step with hope, man. Hope is Jesus Christ. It's got a name, Jesus. There's no true hope apart from Jesus. As a matter of fact, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 7 said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Trust and hope. He said in verse 4, the second desire is that you do not become sluggish. And I read the word sluggish, you know, it's like changing the oil in your car after when you should have done it two, two years ago. But anyway, and just that sludge. I say sluggish. I make my own words up. Don't be sluggish. And all that sludge, you know, it's like, man, dude, why don't you change your oil once in a while? Sluggish, it's that word we talked about before, idle. It's being idle. We must continue in, in the good word. We must press on to... And our faith, as a matter of fact, Galatians, Paul said it this way in 6, 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You go to pastor's conferences and many times they'll say, hey, you're going to get tired in the ministry. But you should never get tired of the ministry. 
And then the next guest speaker says, well, I don't know about you, man. I'm both. And then we lay hands on him and fire him. But um, no. Idleness is the key that the enemy uses to enter your mind with doubt. You're idle. You're not in the word. You're not in prayer. Just going through the motions. And all of a sudden, these invented thoughts come into your mind. Well, I haven't been in church for three weeks. Oh, they probably don't like me anyway. Oh, nobody even notices me. As a matter of fact, nobody even said good morning to me the last time. You know, and these, these thoughts, man, you know, that the enemy brings in there. And, ha- and it, what does it do to us? It stumbles us. It freezes us in place. We're not, we're not progressing in faith. We're digressing. That's not good. The third desire is, notice with me, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In other words, you know, as, as you're growing in your faith, look, look at those. Sometimes our friends get saved, right? And, uh, and they look at us and say, man, you're a Christian? Really? Wow. And, and they just see us. We, we're not showcasing anything. We're just who we are in Christ and and they said, man, I can't believe it, man. You know, some of my friends back in the hood, you know, they text me, some of my cousins, and I've seen you on TV. What are you doing on there, man? You're a pastor. And, I, and it gives me an opportunity to share with them, and they come to Christ. And I tell them, look, follow the Lord, man. Follow the Lord. Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. But here he he wants them to think to those who have, well, who who have been in that place, who who have been given promises and by God and and how God has fulfilled those promises and how God has used those people, like like themselves and like you and me. He says, don't become sluggish. Remain faithful to God while waiting patiently for God. That's another heart's appeal. Someone said long obedience in the same direction takes faith and patience. Long obedience in the same direction is a disciple of Christ and that takes faith and that takes patience. And the writer is saying follow or imitate in the steps of those who in the past because we know the Hebrews that they are very um, well-versed and they love their past, their, their past heritage. And so he's using that here. He says, follow or imitate those who in the past, by faith and patience, served the Lord of hope and inherited the promises. And one of the ones that he chooses to speak of is a great pillar of faith, No, not Moses, but Abraham. And there's a reason behind that for you and I this morning as well. Yeah, Abraham, he wants to to talk about a faithful example in the life of Abraham. He says in 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And here it is saying, verse 14, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. So he takes them back to Genesis. A wonderful book or a scroll, we could say, that they they loved. They loved the scroll of Genesis. It's, It's back to the beginning. And it's there where this promise that he's speaking of here was first given to Genesis. And as we would call Genesis chapter 12. That a great nation will be established through the seed of Abraham. And how that promise became clear, a clearer reality in Genesis 21. And even in his failure, Abraham failed so much. Abraham was much like us that as God gave this promise, as God gave this oath, because he had to learn to patiently wait, and we all know we hate waiting. Abraham got ahead of God, did he not? 
And in the flesh, he tried to bring this promise to pass in his own flesh. And how he slept with Hagar and thought, well, this could be the child now. But God said, no, I reject that. That's not the son of promise. You got ahead of me. You got into the flesh. Abraham was just like us. Got ahead of God. But God says, no, I'm going to be true to my word. I will bring it to pass. I don't need your help, Abraham. I just need you to be obedient and patient. And he learned that. Verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. He patiently endured. He waited 25 years for God to fulfill that promise and faithfully believed even in his old age of 100. How many here are 100? Anyway, he waited for the son of promise who, by the way, they named Isaac. And it was born to him and Sarah. And Sarah was in her what? 90s. Think about that. God always loves to use old couples to bring sons of promise. He did that in the New Testament as well, didn't he? To bring the forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist. He loves to use the impossible in our eyes. To, to encourage us, to build us up. That what's impossible for man is possible for God. He loves to open wounds that way. I love that, man. Genesis 21, 1 and 3 says this, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Underline that. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time. God's time. Of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him. Whom Sarah bore to him. Isaac. Now Isaac means what? Laughter. Means laughter. And there's a story behind that. If you don't know Genesis, I'll let you read it. But when God first came to Abraham to tell him that he was going to have this child, what did Sarah do? She's in the tent listening. You know how you gals are. (laughs) And she starts laughing. She starts cracking up as if God couldn't hear her. And so what was a joke to the mind at first brought joy to the heart. In her old age, in their old age, brought joy in the heart for this couple. And from Isaac, who was born, would come Jacob. And from Jacob would come Israel. And from Israel would come Jesus. God keeps his promises. God has an intent. God has a purpose for everything. And you see how he's how the writer is working this in to this letter to encourage the people. Well, verse 16, he speaks of the immutability of God. I know how to say that word, the first service. For men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them and an end of all dispute. I mean, men go before the Judge, men take an oath, men confirm to other men. Uh, They do it with the ending words of, so help me who? God. Imagine that. So help me God. Yet some still lie under that oath. They wouldn't know God from Casper the friendly ghost. How many of you remember Casper the friendly ghost? Raise your hand. Old and old people. Older people I like that older I'm going to use that now older I'm not saying everyone does but a lot of people they'll they'll go on their oath you know and they'll lie but God swears by no other name than himself in keeping his word 
and promises to us. We could say that God would say, so help me, me. Me, the I am. I said it and I will do it and it will come to pass. Thus, verse 17, God determining to show more abundantly the heirs of promise. I like that. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Now, yes, Abraham had to wait 25 years for his son of promise. But it would be 2,000 years when the Messiah would come. That's which, which he swore came to pass. You got to see that. This is why he's speaking this way. That if God didn't keep his promise, we will be more such wretched people lost in our sins. And he did this to prove, look at verse 18, that by two immutable things, immutable, that word means unchangeable. And the word things <laughs> is pragma. It means an accomplished fact. So that by two unchangeable proven facts, he tells them, in which it is impossible, impotent, unable to be done for God to what? To lie. God doesn't play games, man. He don't play games like man. He doesn't lie like man. He keeps his promises. He keeps his oath, I can say. Malachi 3.6 Alpha says, For I am the Lord. I don't change. I don't change. He's like fine gold. How, How can fine gold turn out to be fake fool's gold? It can't. It's fine gold. It's been... Tested, it's been determined, it's been through the fire, it's proven. You don't change it, it doesn't change, that's what it is. Well, God is God doesn't vacillate in his promises and words and oaths. And it's based upon his attribute of immutability. And that it's impossible for God to lie. Now notice it goes on to say that we might have strong consolation. That word might shouldn't be there. It should read, we have strong consolation. We have strong comfort. We have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now that refuge, I'll tell you right now, is Jesus Christ. But again, he takes them to... um, Numbers 35. He takes them to Joshua chapter 20. Those are your homework. That's your homework to read tonight. Numbers 35, Joshua 20. What's he speaking of? We have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. That hope is Christ. That that hope is salvation. Well, here he uses the cities of refuge as an illustration of to show that Jesus is now our refuge. In other words, let me tell you a little bit about the cities of refuge. Again, you will read it later on. If you accidentally took the life of another person, as we would call manslaughter, you could flee to a designated city. Designated as God laid out the different cities in those chapters as I gave to you to read. They were called cities of refuge. And as you would run there, because guess who's chasing you? The family of the deceased. So you would run there, and the elders of the city would take you in, judge your case, and if they found no malice in your actions, like, like you know, you're chopping wood and the axe head falls off and just happens to fall on top of fellow worker's head or something, you know, I didn't mean to do that, but... If they, if they find no malice in it, you would remain under that city's protection. The avenger the, of blood, the, the one who is going to come after you to avenge their loved one or to avenge this death, couldn't touch you. They couldn't find vengeance. They couldn't proceed with their vengeance. 
However, if you left, then you were on your own. Don't leave. Stay in that city. And you were finally able to be freed from that city of refuge to go back home upon the death of the high priest. Whoever was the high priest during that time, once he died, you were able to be released. I would still look over my shoulder. But anyway, you were, you know, in other words, the high priest's death ended the statute of limitations and you could no longer be punished. So here, the writer is, is sharing this. They know that. They know the city's a refuge. They understand that. And, he, and, he's, and, he's, and he's using it as an illustration to apply it to Christ, which is a picture of hope in Christ. Jesus is our city of refuge. We ran to him as sinners, realizing that when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. He was not just speaking of those there at Calvary. Friend, he was speaking of you and me and our sins that put him on that cross. We were all guilty of manslaughter. And if you haven't accepted Christ, you are still guilty of manslaughter. And the soul that sins must die. And if you die in that sin, you'll be separated from God. And so as we ran to Christ, as we realized, wow, Lord, you died for my sin. You took the penalty of my sin. The avenger of blood, Satan himself, who's trying to come after me and and wants me to die in my sin so I will end up there in in, in torments and and damnation. Well, we run to Jesus Christ. He's our city of refuge. And since he is our high priest who already died, and guess what? Rose from the dead, praise God. In Christ, we can never be prosecuted for our sins. Father God looks at us and says, not guilty. Paid in full. Well done. Good and faithful servant. That speaks much to us. And you see the writer's thoughts and why he's using this. Let me tell you, Hebrews, man, is full of Old Testament applications. You're going to be in the Old Testament as we continue through. We haven't already, we've already been in the Old Testament. And then he says, this hope that I just spoke of, this hope of God keeping his promise, this hope of God will never lie, this this hope that he is our refuge, we can always run to him, we can always be reminded of that. But he says, this hope, verse 19, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The writer describes hope as an anchor. Now, I'm not a sailor. (laughs) But when I looked up the purpose of an anchor, it says an anchor is to be part of, is that right, Terry? Be part of what holds uh, a vessel in place. Now I'm finding out it's actually the, the chain that does most of the most of the holding, most of the holding in place. And, and the anchor is more of the foundation, more of the, the device used to bring the chain down. But anyway, the anchor was an early Christian symbol commonly found in the Roman catacombs, the, the burial grounds. as a symbol of hope the Christians would use and, and knowing that and death I be with Christ and, and that there is life beyond the, the grave. We have some pictures here of actual, um, what would you call them? Pictures or drawings of ancient anchors done by Christians on grave sites in the catacombs. You see the two fish there. And so it's interesting how they use these, and they use this verse, they used this verse to, uh, to bring about the, the purpose of an anchor in the life of the, of the Christian. Some of them would use the cross, instead of putting a cross, they would use it as an anchor. And you've even seen people wear it as jewelry. They don't even know what the cross means, but they like the jewelry. 
The NLT says this in verse 19. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. And as Christians, it symbolizes our security in our salvation in Christ. Jesus, or the word of God, the Holy Spirit says, for all who call upon the Lord shall be what? It's God's promise of eternal life. He goes on and says in verse 19, and which, that is this hope we have in Christ, enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us. Even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to get more into this Melchizedek, this, this strange priest, this high priest that shows up in the Old Testament and how the writer uses it as a type of Christ. And we'll get more into that in chapter 7. Read ahead. But our hope, our confidence as believers, I love this, takes us beyond the holy of holies as we talked about before. The heaven, heavens. It takes us into the Holy is a holy. It takes us into the presence of, of the Lord, and we are promised that. That come death or rapture, we will be in the presence of God. And that's what this great hope is in our life. Guys, when the seas get high <laughs> and our ship's rocking, let us remember that we are anchored deep in our Lord. And it's going to happen. If it hasn't happened already, it's going to happen. Christians are, as I've said before, we are, we are not without trials. We're not exempt from trials. We're not exempt from tribulations. We're not exempt from these worldly things that are thrown at us. As a matter of fact, we have a bullseye on our back. The enemy hates us. And he's trying to keep us from fulfilling these, you know, what God has called us to, keep us from furthering in our walk. But we can trust Jesus in the storm just as we have trusted him in the calm. You've trusted him in the calm is a word for somebody. Now you're going through a storm, trust him the same way that you've trusted him when it was calm. You trusted him in the valley, Well, trust him as you face that mountain now the same way because he never changes. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. I'll end with this. Scott Cunningham had a song and it was called Anchored Deep. He said this, I'm anchored deep in your great love. I'm anchored deep in who you are. I'm anchored deep in your holy word. I'm anchored deep in you, my Lord. I'm anchored deep. So, Father, that's what we pray we leave here today, God, as, as you bring the rain, Lord, which just means we're going to stay longer to fellowship with one another. But may we leave here knowing that you don't lie. You're not a liar like us, God. You're going to keep your promises. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. God, we're going to see you one day. We have that hope, God, because without it, we'd be just miserable people. But maybe there are some here today, Lord, that have yet, the first step is, is to obtain that hope, have, have yet to obtain that hope. They, they've come in here, there is no hope, God. They've been burned, backstabbed, They've been turned away. They've been cheated on, God. And now perhaps they're here among us. And I'm telling you, friend, if that's you, Jesus Christ is your answer. He's your hope. And today you can leave here having a relationship with him. Even though you don't know anything about the Bible, you don't know anything about Epistles, maybe you had an exposure to Christianity in some sort, a Sunday school, uh, a friend invited you. 
But let me tell you, you can have that relationship today by simply humbling yourself before God and just praying a prayer of repentance. Believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, that he died there, man. He paid the penalty of your sin. And not only that, on the third day, it tells us he rose again, overcoming death and decay. He did all that for you, friend. And if you're here today, you want to receive Christ, just pray. Uh, Let me just, I'll put into words basically what should come from your heart. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. (laughs) I'm in need of a savior. I'm in need of the, of an anchor for my soul, a savior. Today, God, I receive you as Lord and savior. Come into my life, God, as wretched as it is, as messed up as it is. I receive you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, the prayer team will be up here. We've got a Bible that's a New Testament, but it has a lot of answers to your questions. It's a really cool Bible that we buy, and it's got a lot of answers, a lot of insights to help you on your way. If you prayed that prayer and sincerely meant it, come up and pray with them again, and uh, that's just for you. It's our free gift for you because salvation is free, amen? It's a free gift in Jesus Christ. God bless you guys.